All right. Welcome, everybody, again for uh, virtual seminars on Precambrian geology, this time in 2022 after the holidays, after a few weeks break. Um, it's great to be back. Uh, we've got some changes. Uh, well, we've got a full, almost a full schedule up through to, uh, to, the, to the summer. So definitely go to the website and check that out. Um, I'm still waiting on some titles for, from some people, but uh, they'll come as we get closer, I'm sure. Oh, we also have a new page on our website. It's the Code of Conduct page. It's going to be the last tab on the website. Whenever anybody joins a VSPG meeting room, we expect that, uh, that the points outlined there are going to be, going to be kept uh, starting now effectively. Um, so go there and give it a read. It looks um, very similar to a lot of code of conduct pages you've probably seen around, but some of the some something that's different for our seminar is that we allow the discussion session at the end to just kind of run as as much as it needs to. And I think that that is a time when scientists can get kind of excited about their work. So that might be a time where we need to the, the, that might be the critical time during our seminar series that we need to try and keep in mind that we're all trying to be productive. Um, I, we haven't had issues, but that's just something I'd like to point out. And we made some specific points in the in the code of conduct related to that. So give that a read. Um, there's also points about conduct on YouTube and, and whatnot. So uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead. Um, and I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Paul Hoffman for us today. I'm going to give, he, he gave a talk for us, our first talk for a presentation ever last year in February. Um, I gave a sort of different introduction for him then that I, than I will today. So if you want to see one that's more detailed on his career, go back and check that out. Um, but some of the highlights, uh, so Paul spent his career being a very multidisciplinary Precambrian geologist, bridging studies of sedimentary geology, tectonics, geochemistry, and geobiological concepts throughout his career. We know him pretty well for his work on the Neoproterozoic Snowball Earth. And if you'd like to see a talk on that, definitely revisit last year's. Um, he spent his career working for the Canadian Geologic Survey and as faculty for the University of Victoria and Harvard. But what I really wanted to highlight today is his contribution to our seminar series so far. As I mentioned, this is his second time presenting for us, and he's kicking us off on a new year again. So after his first presentation, he's returned almost every week, giving great feedback to many of our presenters. Even outside of the VSPG meeting room, he would often offer feedback, suggestions, and assistance to speakers and even to Andre and I on how we are conducting this. So I think this really highlights his dedication to the Precambrian geology community, and we're really happy to have him back. So Paul, the stage is yours, go ahead. Oh, Paul, we're gonna have to get you to unmute. Sorry about that. Down in the bottom left, yeah. Bottom left, a little bit further down. You see a mute button? No. Go as far down to the bottom left corner as possible. Oh, you're gonna have to go to your, sorry. You're gonna have to go to your, uh, your Zoom. Okay, right I got, it. Okay. got it. okay, great, we got gotcha. you. Okay, <clears throat> so welcome from uh, Snowy Victoria. And I want to begin by expressing uh, all of our uh, gratitude to uh, Alex and Andre for, uh, uh, organizing this uh, seminar series. Uh, really, its success speaks for itself. So we're, we're greatly indebted to you. This has uh, been a lifesaver for the last uh, uh, year or so. Now, um, when I'm asked why I've spent my entire career working in the Precambrian, I usually respond by saying, because it's different. The only reason to study these ancient rocks is to learn what you couldn't learn from more easily from studying younger rocks. But it's not uncommon that uh, what you find in the Precambrian isn't so different. In fact, in many cases, uh, you see features that are very similar uh, 
to what you can observe in the Mesozoic or Cenozoic. And uh, sometimes uh, these features uh, are well known in the Cenozoic, but only as individual examples and not as a, a generic class of structures. And uh, so I wanna talk about, uh, tell you a story today about an example of uh, such a structure, <clears throat> which I think actually does uh, represent a generic class of structures, but which hasn't been recognized as such. And I think we, we all have a much stronger motivation to, uh, uh, to understand the origin of stru such structures if, if we realize that they represent a class uh, not an individual oddball. And I think our chances of, of reaching an understanding uh, will be much greater as well. So uh, to begin, uh, uh, let me, um, oh, now wait a minute, I'm having uh, trouble advancing here. Try the, uh, the arrow in the bottom left, there's little arrows. Oh yeah, okay, all right. Huh. Okay, there we okay. go. All right, so the, the structures I'm gonna be talking about um, are tight compressional anticlines that are associated with subduction zones, but they occur where the subducting plate is subducting into a cusp. Okay, so it's a re-entrant in the subduction zone and these tight, anticlinal uplifts are oriented uh, transverse to the regional structure. In other words, they're, they're oriented parallel to the down dip uh, direction of the subduction zone. And they appear in both the subducting plate and also the overriding plate, but I will argue that they originate from the subducting plate and the, uh, their appearance in the overriding plate is a response uh, to a deformation in the subducting plate. And so the talk is gonna have uh, three parts. Uh, the first part, I'm gonna introduce some Cenozoic examples, uh, including examples both on oceanic plates and on continental plates, because they're a feature of subducting lithosphere. So it doesn't, they occur both in oceanic and in continental areas. This, the, the second third of the talk, I will describe this Ediacaran example, which is how I got interested in this in Northwestern Namibia. Um, where there was an Ediacaran subduction zone uh, going into a cusp. And then in the third part of the talk, I'm going to introduce a mechanical or a geometrical explanation. Um, it's an explanation that I thought I originated, but as so often happens, it turns out <laughs> that it was actually uh, advanced about 40 years ago uh, by a person who lives right here in Victoria. Um, but uh, it never really widely took on because it was only ever um, uh, applied uh, to the local example. And so first of all, I want to uh, define what I mean by a cusp. Now, when lithosphere is bent into a subduction zone, um, it forms arcs. And that's because of it, the lithosphere is on a spherical surface. And so the North Pacific shows a number of these arcs and the arcs are linked at cusps, okay? They're linked together at cusps. And right within this field of view here, there are five cusps, numbered one, two, three, four, and five. And uh, this one here, for example, off central Honshu is actually a triple junction. And I'm gonna be talking about the ones where there are just two plates involved. And um, so Kareel, Kamchatka, Gulf of Alaska, and Cascadia. And these two in the middle here, Kamchatka and Gulf of Alaska, these are places where the subduction is not going directly into the cusp, but it's going in sideways. So it's subducting orthogonally relative to one trench and more or less strike slip relative to the other. And I'm not gonna be talking about these two, although I will come back at the end of the talk and, 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 and say and point out that there may be a mechanical reason why the sideways subduction in cusps is favored. The, the kind I'm gonna be talking about specifically are, the, are the, the numbers three and, and six, the Kareel and Cascadia. And in the Kareel subduction zone, you don't see much at the surface, but what is observed from seismology is that the dip of the slab is much shallower um, in the cusp than it is on either side. On either side, the slab's dipping about 30, 35 degrees, whereas here on the cusp, it's, only, it's dipping less than 20 degrees. 
And then the other example, which is I'm looking at, if I could see it through the snow, is the Olympic Mountains in the Cascadia cusp where the Juan de Fuca plate is subducting under, underneath North America. Now the Olympic Mountains um, is an area of, of which is a structural anticline. So here's a, a structural map. And what you see here in, is exposed a window of neogene accretionary complex that is structurally beneath this previously accreted Eocene oceanic plateau, the Silesia terrain. So this structurally, it's an anticline. And from, ge from thermal chronology, we know that this is undergoing very rapid exhumation at the present time. And in fact, there are some people who think that this structure is driven primarily by heavy rainfall and erosion. And so it's being driven from the top. But on the other hand, we know from seismology, from earthquakes, and there are a lot of earthquakes in this area in the Puget Lowlands, the, um, uh, um, the focal mechanisms of these earthquakes consistently indicate strong compressional stress oriented parallel to the trench. Okay, and that's in itself rather unusual. And it suggests that the Olympic Mountains is being driven at depth by compression in the subducting plate that is oriented parallel to the trench. Now I wanna begin uh, by showing a couple of, uh, a few other, three other Cenozoic examples that involve subduction of continental lithosphere. Two in the Himalayas, and one where the Arabian plate is subducting underneath Eurasia. So I wanna begin with the Himalayan examples and we'll begin over here uh, at the wet end of the Himalayas, um, which is in the Assam province of, uh, of, of India, which is predominantly a Muslim area. Uh, and these people are suffering very much now under the uh, ultra-nationalist uh, um, Hindu regime of uh, Modi. So the Assam uh, cusp forms where the Himalayan arc meets the Indo-Burman ranges arc. And it's a lowland, this is a subducting plate, the Brahmaputra River. And the first thing you notice is there's a little baby uplift here that just started, began to rise in the early Pliocene called the Shilong Plateau. And the Shilong Plateau ca caused a deviation, a diversion of the Brahmaputra River, which formerly drained straight down into the Bay of Bengal. Now this is actually just a baby uplift and its, and its daddy is up here at the Eastern end of the Himalayan mountains. And there right where the Yarlung Tsongpo River does the famous bend and then drains down into the Brahmaputra is a great massif of the Namchibarwa Julaperi. And so here's the river, the Indus Tsongpo, it comes around, going around here and then cuts across this basement massif and then down and drains into the Brahmaputra. And this is the mountain of Namchibawa, which was not climbed until the early 1990s and, uh, and its sister on the other side of the river Jalaperi. Now, these structures here, notice the north arrow here, they're just slightly west of north, actually represent Indian lower plate basement that has been pushed up entirely through. So here's the Indian basement in the core of the structure. Here's Namchibarwa, Julaperi, here's the river. And uh, here's Tethian cover, okay. And then the main mantle thrust and the overriding plate here is the Gangdizi batholith, which is the arc batholith on the south margin of uh, the Lhasa block of Tibet, okay. So the Indian basement of the lower plate has been pushed up in a tight anticline right up through the upper plate and through the arc of the overriding plate. So this is a pretty spectacular uh, structure with uh, you know, half a crustal thickness worth of, uh, of structural relief. Now, uh, you might think that this, uh, these unusual structures here are related to the heavy rainfall at the Eastern end of the Himalayas because of the proximity of the Bay of Bengal. But if you come over to the Western syntax, as it's called uh, in the Himalayan region, funny word, this word syntax, uh, it originated uh, uh, with uh, um, uh, 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 Hertha Solis in her official English translation of The Face of the Earth by Edvard Zeus, published in 1905. 
Um, it's a translation uh, of uh, a term that Zeus introduced called Scharunk, which has multiple meanings in German, but uh, according to Solus, uh, what, 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 uh, 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 what Zeus actually meant was not the bend, but rather Scharunk means, in, it means a closing ranks and trooping along together. So what he was referring to is a number of belts come together and then troop to get them I in mean, parallel around this bend. So the term a bent uh, syntaxis uh, is, is actually not a redundancy. I, I prefer cusp, it's just simpler. So uh, to come back at the dry end of the, uh, of the Himalayan arc here in the Hazara syntaxis between the Himalayan arc and the Suleiman arc, there is a, a, a pair of structures that are highly analogous to, uh, to those at the Eastern end. So here's the main boundary thrust of the Himalayas. Here are the higher Himalayan crystallines. This is the Indian basement. Here's the Tethian cover. And then here's the uh, thin skin thrust belt, uh, foreland thrust belt out the front that's riding on a detachment in Eocambrian salt. And uh, here's the Hazara, which is a, a transverse anticline that refolds the main boundary thrust. But it's the baby, it's the new one. And back here's the daddy, the Nanga Parbat massif, and where the Indian basement has been pushed up and deforms the main mantle thrust, which, it, uh, uh, which carries on its hanging wall, a Cretaceous island arc, a full crustal section of an island arc, the, the Kohistan Ladakh uh, island arc. And this is the collision zone in the early Eocene uh, that's well dated, but this is not the collision with Eurasia that collision suture is this northern suture whose age is still uh, not really tightly uh, determined. So this is the structure. What is the origin of, these, of this tight anticline that, uh, that pushes up here? <clears throat> and um, so here's the Indus River that comes up. And once again, it crosses right, right across. So this is antecedent drainage. And that shows how recent this, this uplifted feature is that the river uh, course was already established and maintained its position uh, during this 15 kilometers or more of a tight anticlinal uplift in Nanga Parbat. So here's the Nanga Parbat massif here exposing the basement. And then here's the main mantle thrust that wraps all the way around. And then this structure is plunging off to the north. Nanga Parbat itself is here. Paramash is the big mountain on the other side, on the north side of the uh, of the Indus River. And uh, here it is here. So this is Haramash, that's Indian basement up there. And uh, this is, uh, these are mafic um, um, cumulates uh, from the lower crust of the Kohistan uh, Cretaceous Island Arc that's been thrust over the top of, the, of India. And then the whole thrust sheet has been deformed into this enormous anticline. So you get something of the scale of the structure. Uh, here's Nanga Parbat itself. Uh, there's five kilometers of, of vertical topographic relief here between the top of Nanga Parbat and this glacier, and uh, another almost three kilometers down to the Indus River, which is just off to the left. I, I took this uh, photograph on the, my flight back to Islamabad from Gilgit. <laughs> And it, it's a, I, so I, I had the good fortune um, uh, to join Mike Searle on, a, on an expedition to K2. I've, 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 I've never worked in a field area that's so crowded because <laughs> there were just scores and scores of porters that were uh, uh, carrying equipment in for mountain climbers that going up to K2. Uh, this is the, the, uh, the, 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 the Mashabrum uh, group and the Gashabrum group at the north end of uh, the Baltoro Glacier. This is all Triassic uh, limestone here. And uh, I think that's maybe my tent there. And uh, that's the Baltoro Glacier. <laughs> it's only you know, a kilometer or two across, but it takes about two hours to walk across. And um, <laughs> you don't want to experience an earthquake when you're in here. <laughs> all this stuff's gonna come down and you will never be seen again. Um, so it's a funny area to work, it's spectacular rocks, but an awful lot of time and effort per outcrop. Um, so, you know, the scenes here are almost biblical. These are the, uh, these, are these uh, tribesmen from the Northeastern Pakistan. They got running shoes and sandals and up here carrying these enormous loads. Notice the Triassic limestone. 
but these guys actually eat better than the English geologists. So we mo mostly eat curried goat and, and doll with these guys. <laughs> so um, anyway, so uh, I want now, uh, next one to uh, describe another feature. Oh, and I should point out that those two structures at either end of the Himalayas, they have been, you know, they, it is recognized that they, they are, they, those are structures in common, but they've never been related to structures anywhere else in the world, including this one here, which is not all that far away. I mean, here's the Suleiman arc, it's just over, just off the page in the right. So the seismologists used to call this the Oman line, and we're all familiar with this uh, geography here. This is the peninsula that sticks off Arabia and almost closes off the Persian Gulf at the Strait of Hormuz. And notice that this uh, structure here, this peninsula, which is a plunging tight anticline, uh, is aimed right for this cusp where the Zagros uh, thrust and fold belt joins the Macron accretionary prism. So the Zagros is a foreland thrust and fold belt associated with the collision of Arabia with Eurasia, which began at the end of the Oligocene, and the Persian Gulf is a foreland basin. The Macron is its continuation, but here we still have oceanic lithosphere of the Arabian Sea subducting because the continental margin of Arabia has a dog leg here. And so here's the continental margin of Arabia. And the dark rocks here are the Samael Ophiolite, which is a Cretaceous Ophiolite, which resulted from a continental margin, a spreading ridge collision in the early late Cretaceous. And so this structure is completely older than this anticline and the Samael Ophiolite and all the underlying thrusts are actually refolded by, 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 by this uh, 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 late Oligocene, early Miocene structure. So here's a cross, a cross section from Mike Searle, an east-west uh, cross section which shows the whole story. So here's the Samael Ophiolite. Here are the Hawassana thrusts underneath it. So this is imbricated Tethian margin carbonates. Here is the Atokthon on the Arabian shield, but the Atokthon is folded into an anticline, which is a ramp anticline above a thrust, which has 10 kilometers of slip of early Miocene and younger strata. So this thrust here is associated with the Arabia-Eurasia collision, not with the Samael Ophiolite abduction, okay? So there are some four examples, Olympic Peninsula, Kareel also, uh, the three in uh, Eurasia uh, of these funny tight compressional anticlines that are transverse to the structure that are localized where subduction is occurring in a cusp, okay? So what's the story? So now let's begin the second part, and that's how I got into this story. And so I've been working now for you know quarter century uh, up here in northeastern uh, Namibia on a carbonate succession, and uh, I've always been eyeing this disconformity at the top of the carbonate succession, which represents the passive margin to forty transition, where the Congo craton was subducting into a trench at a cusp. Uh, where the Damra belt and the Kalko belt meet. So this is a cusp where the Congo uh, 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 plate was subducting uh, in mid-Ediacaran -E uh, time into this cusp. Okay. And uh, this is my current uh, thinking about, uh, about the, you know, the plate tectonics of this uh, uh, damra kalko a triple junction. So here's the Congo plate, the Kalahari plate. We know that at 1110, uh, these two uh, uh, cratons were together in almost their present position. Uh, Kalahari was slightly rotated clockwise relative to Congo. We know that from the because the Umkondo large igneous uh, uh, province on Kalahari craton also appears on Congo craton, and there's good paleomag from both. Now the Damra belt only opened up and but only lasted for about 100 million years and then closed again. So it didn't open probably very wide. And I think that the, the simplest explanation, uh, the, the, the Damra belt is a two prong belt, there are actually two collision zones here, one that's around 600 and one that's around 550. And the simplest explanation, because we know that this Congo craton here had a south facing margin and a west facing shear because all the extension here is north south. 
And so I think the Kalahari Kraton pulled away. Then there was a subduction initiation, a, 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 a narrow terrain, a ribbon was pulled back, collided with Congo Kraton back where it came from around 600 that formed this Northern suture, opening up a basin behind. And then Kalahari came back in. It's a sort of like a mini Tethian model and collided at 550. That's when the Kalahari is the underplate and the uh, and, and uh, Congo Kraton is the overriding plate. Now, the important thing for this story is this panel right here. So this is where the subduction is occurring into a cusp. As I've drawn it here, it's actually a three plate situation, but uh, what goes on in the upper plate is less important for, for my story today, which really concerns the lower plate. So critical to my story, and if this isn't right, my story's all wrong. And that is that these subduction zones in, in the Damra belt and in the Kalko belt were contemporaneous. And, and you, it would be great to have better geochronology, but as it stands, we have argon-argon ages for D1 uh, metamorphic micas, which range from 600 to about 584 or so. And then over in this belt here, we have a uranium lead zircon age from a melt pod. So probably a little bit higher grade, a little bit later than this, uh, that, that's dated around 580. So they're close. I can't demonstrate from this that they're contemporaneous. Could be proved wrong with better geochronology, but the existing geochronology at least allows that these two subduction zones are broadly contemporaneous. On structural grounds, we know that this deformation outlasted this deformation because the D1 deformation here is clearly cross-cut by D2 deformation that is in the calco orientation. Now, the succession I've been working on is the southern margin of the, of the Congo Craton, right around that cusp. And it's a rift to passive margin sequence, dominantly in carbonate. And, and of course, there are the two glacial horizons that are on this, on this carbonate platform, the Sturdian and the Maranoan. And then here's the disconformity where the carbonate platform dies and is overlain by the synorogenic classics of what I interpret to be a 4D. And uh, so there is a disconformity uh, at, the, at, the, at that surface. And so I view this as a, as a rifted passive margin that enters a, 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 a south and west dipping subduction zone or southwest dipping subduction zone in the cusp. And so here's the situation. Uh, if you're on the lower plate, I'm keeping the lower plate fixed here just so you can see the succession of events. You start at sea level on the carbonate plateau you go over the four bulge as the, as the load approaches. So you get an uplift that causes the disconformity. In the next step, you're on a starved outer slope situation. The next step, you're in the four deep. So you're being buried in all this sediment, which is an upward shoaling sequence from in the classic case of the Alps from Flish to Molossa. And then in the last stage, crunch, you get kinematically transferred structurally from the lower plate to the upper plate and the deformation starts. Now, uh, the flexural properties of oceanic lithosphere and to a less extent of continental lithosphere are fairly well known. And the height, the characteristic height of the four bulge is around a half a kilometer. And remember that figure because we're gonna be able to estimate the four bulge height in this uh, Ediacaran cusp and it's not gonna be half a kilometer. Okay, so here's the full belt. The blue are the carbonates. The pink is the old basement. The brown are the four deep plastics. And the four deep plastics everywhere in this belt rest on top of the carbonates, except right in the cusp. And you'll notice in these three places where there are arrows, the four deep plastics are coming right down and sit on the basement, okay? And you can see this on the map of Namibia. And I saw it when I first went over there, I looked at the map in Namibia, I said, boy, that's strange. Because I looked at the setup and right away I said, oh, this is passive margin, this is 40, because there's no, you know, some, there's no arc magnetism on the Congo Kraton anywhere. And so I said, what, what is this? I've always been sort of casting my eye at this disconformity <laughs> above the succession I was working on. Okay, so here's a little bit more detailed map. Uh, here's the basement. Here's the uh, Otavi group uh, platform will cover. And uh, here are the four deep plastics. Uh, this is an antiformal uplift. 
And um, this is the edge, the outer edge of the platform. And then this is the four slope. And you can see here, the, the class is cut down and sit on the basement. There's a fault there. And then, but you've got this outlier, this paleo outlier at the edge of the platform of carbonates come back again. And, uh, and then they're cut off. And there's 25 kilometers here where the classics sit directly on the basement. And then the, the Otavi you know, reappears again. And so um, I don't have time to show you all of these, uh, these cutoffs, so I'm gonna show you two of them. We're gonna start with this one because this is just a little tributary drainage. So it's a relatively small Paleo Valley. And then I'm gonna come over here and show you a big one where the whole succession gets cut off and there's actually a, uh, a valley and it cut down into the basement. And, and here is where we can actually determine uh, what the relief on this ancient karstic topography, which is related to the four bulge uplift, uh, how much that actually is. Okay, so here's the little valley. And uh, so this is a panel. Uh, this is the basement HG. And, it's, and so this is the, 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 uh, the carbonate, uh, uh, cryogenian and ediacaran car, uh, carbonates that are dipping uh, to the south. That's dipping towards the bottom of the uh, image. There's a syncline, an anticline, and then a monocline dipping to the south. Um, this is ediacaran in blue. That's the, the Maranoan glacial uh, horizon here. And then these are the, uh, the inner snowball cryogenian. And then this is the four deep classics. And they come along here. They've been running along for you know, a few t you know, uh, 20 kilometers or so uh, with a disconformity surface at the top of the ediacaran carbonates. And in here they cut all the way down through the stratigraphy and then back up again. And you can see the stratigraphy in this incisement are truncated at the margin. And because we know this stratigraphy here very well, we can determine that this Paleo Valley here had uh, 760 meters of, of relief. And here it is uh, in an oblique uh, satellite image. There's the Maranoan glacial sequence there, the stratigraphy coming up. And here's the, uh, the Paleo Valley and its fill. Okay, quite a spectacular little structure. Now that structure we've just been looking at is this one here, this little one. And so I'm gonna come over and, and show you what you see here. Okay, so here's another satellite image. Uh, we're looking towards the Southeast now, uh, somewhat obliquely, but at quite a steep angle, there's the North Arrow. So this is a basement, crystalline basement, uh, lots of heterogeneity and interesting structure here. Boy, someone should come and look at these basement rocks. And never really, you know, they've been mapped, but uh, no, almost no geocon or anything else. Um, and uh, and then so they're unconformly overlain by the carbonates. So this is the outer edge of the uh, shelf of the carbonates, and then they're directly overlain by the fluvial clastics of the 40 disconformity here. And you can follow these carbonates, and they just call it, this is they just cross this river, and that's the last bit of carbonate because over here between the basement and the fluvial uh, four deep uh, are marine four deep sediments, uh, semi-pelites mostly, silicic clastics. And they come up here and they strike right into the carbonates, okay? And so the contact is right there. If you look at it a little bit more detail, here's the basement, okay? There's the base of the carbonate succession. This is the cryogenian. That's the tubestone stromatolite. That's a cap, the Maranoan cap. This is the ediacaran carbonate here. And then these are the fluvial four deep sediments and these are the marine four deep sediments that are coming around and running right into these carbonates. And as you can see, as they approach the carbonates, <laughs> they start looking a little bit more like the carbonate. And I'll show you in a moment why that is. And notice here, this tubestone stromatolite, the very distinct of the cap carbonate. Down here in this basement incisement, there's a, there's a breccia at the base here and it consists of class of the tube stone. And those class have dropped down 450 meters in ancient topography and uh, end up lodged at the bottom of this valley. Okay. So those four deep classics, the reason they look like carbonate is because they're composed of carbonate. So this is all, you know, this is, you know, alluvium and colluvium uh, coming off that, uh, that escarpment. So here's the base of the, uh, of the four deep, this is the fluvial stuff the paleocurrents, and this is the uh, carbonate succession, and it ramps down. This is the tube stone, comes along and cuts across the tube stone, 
cuts down. The basement comes up here because this is a rift shoulder at the edge of the carbonate platform. And so this is the bottom of the carbonate sequence away from that rift shoulder. And so here, because the basement is uplifted, the basement itself is incised by this marine four deep succession. And that breccia with the tubestone class is right here. And those class came from here. Okay. And here's the tubestone in place. And here are the tubestone in the, in, in the breccia. And uh, here are the tubes in longitudinal section and here in transverse section. Now, uh, those uh, uh, marine uh, 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 sediments are shallow water because, uh, and in fact, some of them may not even be marine because although they're not common in some horizons, you have mud cracks. And because you have mud cracks, you know, you're at least at or above sea level. And so that means that the amount of relief on the forebulge of, of, the, of the carbonate platform, which was deposited at sea level, is the stratigraphic height of that carbonate succession because the floor of that paleo valley was above sea level. Okay. So how much is that? How, how thick is this carbonate succession? Well, as it turns out, uh, this carbonate succession in this area is incomplete. It's, it's truncated at the top by erosion. But what we have here is 450 meters of cryogenian and about the same of Ediacaran. But fortunately, we know the regional thicknesses and stratigraphy of the Ediacaran quite well. So here's this section, okay? And if you go north across the shelf, because the shelf actually has a flexure in it during a, a passive margin subsidence, we see this section it gets progressively thicker, but this thinning here is not because of erosion. It's because of actual thinning, because you can see that all three formations are expanding um, in, in, in proportion. And so because the lower formation is complete in this section, we can use this proportionality to estimate the original total thickness of Ediacaran strata here, which it would be 1400 meters. So that's 1400 meters of Ediacaran to which we need to add 450 meters of cryogenian. So the total thickness of the, Ediac of, of the carbonate succession was 1850 meters. And so that means that the minimum megakarstic relief was 1.85 kilometers, okay? But that's a lot more than half a kilometer. So something very strange is going on here. And for reference, 1.85 kilometers is almost exactly the maximum depth of the Grand Canyon of Arizona. So here's the story as I imagine, here's our passive margin. It's going over a fall bulge, four bulge into a trench. And as it goes over the four bulge, you, it gets uplifted and you develop this mega karstic topography, but of extraordinary uh, you know, topographic relief, uh, which implies that the amplitude of the four bulge uplift is three to four times uh, the normal half kilometer, okay? So, you know, surely somehow this has got to be related to the cusp because these features like those Himalayan, Arabian, Olympic Mountains examples, they're always in cusps. So here's our cusp of the Congo Craton. It's being compressed, it's being pinched. Uh, here's this, uh, you know, uh, mega karstic topography. We looked at the little paleo valley at F and the big escarpment at B. There are also uh, large submarine landslides that I described many years ago now that are, that are coming by directionally off the flanks of, uh, of this uplift. And, um, and, and, and I, you know, I can show you one of these. This is uh, uh, that one up in the Northwest. This is actually folded into a broad anticline and, and syncline, but, and it's plunging. So that allows you to reconstruct the whole structure uh, in outcrop. And if you straighten it out and, 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 and back tilt it, what you see is that there's a low angle normal fault, which cuts down through the entire thickness of the carbonate succession. And you, all the cutoffs in the foot wall can match with the cutoffs in the hanging wall. So you can accurately estimate the amount of displacement on this fault, which is just over 20 kilometers. Uh, you can straighten out the length so that the, uh, the, 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 the fault plane itself forms a series of ramps and flats, but overall the, the angle uh, of, of, of down cutting is just over one degree. And the beauty of this structure is that there's a paleo valley 
<laughs> that's fully exposed here, which is filled with the four deep plastic uh, uh, conglomerate. And we, we know it's at that age because it's folded just like the carbonates. In fact, the, the strata are in, the, in the conglomerate are parallel to the carbonates. And that Paleo Valley cuts right across the detachment surface onto the foot wall. So that is pins the age of the detachment as being post-dating the entire Otavi group, the carbonate, because it cuts through the entire succession and predates all the local 40 classics of the molden. So it's precisely the same age as the megacarstic, uh, 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 to, you know, the karstic topography. Okay, so that's the end of the second third. So now what is the, what, what is the explanation of this? So when I gave this talk at the, at the GACMAC meeting in Quebec City a couple of years ago, I was trying to think what actually goes on when, when a slab subducts uh, into a cusp. And in my mind's eye, I wasn't certain what actually happens to the slab. Does the slab, you know, is there, does it split apart? Is there a gap there from tension? Or that wouldn't fit with the, with, you know, because the structure was saying there's some sort of compression here. And I couldn't figure it out. So I took a piece of paper. And if you got a piece of paper handy, uh, just tear up a, a slip of a paper and do this little experiment. This is exactly what I did. I took a piece of paper and I creased it, okay? So that's gonna be the subduction zone. And I creased it at an angle to make it like a cusp. And the first time I did it, I cut it because it would be easier to let the flaps drop down if I cut it, but you can also do it without the cut. And if you look at the cut and you, then you fold down the, the, the flaps like a subduction zone, what you see is that there's a serious overlap here of, of the two slabs. And that implies there has to be compression here to accommodate that constriction because of the overlap. And if you look at, if you do it without, it's a little bit more difficult to get it to bend down, but, you know, without the cut. But if you do it, what you end up with is a, is a buckle and, 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 and the angle of the slab is forced to be much shallower. And this is a tight compressional structure here. Now this is just, you know, you know if you think about this in the scale, and of course, then you have to add to the, 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 the well-known constriction that's just due to the subducting into the interior of a sphere. This is one that's more specifically related with this geometry. So I was flabbergasted when I did this paper model, um, and, you know, at this simple explanation for the structure. And so of course I immediately dived into my collection of structural geology textbooks, wondering how I missed it. And I couldn't find it anywhere. I, there doesn't seem to be any explanation or recognition of this as, as an inevitable consequence of subduction into a cusp. And so I was really surprised that maybe I'd stumbled onto something new. I always like to think that, you know, in Brickamory, we can teach these Cenozoic people something. So then I was thinking, well, I wonder, you know, there's a lot of resistance to folding that slab like that, buckling the slab. And, and so it should be uh, you know, mechanically less work to subduct sideways. And so that this should be of the, the, the you know, Gulf of Alaska and Kamchatka should be a mechanically a more preferred situation. And so I wondered whether this, uh, you know, this slab constriction should be a stress that should be included in, 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 uh, in, in, in stress models of, you know, of, of, of lithospheric plates to try to understand the mechanics of, uh, of, of plate motions. I don't think any of the, uh, I used to read this literature. I don't think any of the, of, of, of these, uh, uh, you know, plate models have incorporated uh, the effects of, of, of cusp constrictive, uh, cusp constriction as a, um, uh, as a stress guide uh, for, you know, for the motion of the Pacific plate. I mean, it's, to me, it's not so surprising the Pacific plates, you know, heading off this way because it, it doesn't want to have to get all twisted into a knot here in these cusps. Okay, and then the next thing I, I did was, well, what what would you, what happens in the arc? And so it's kind of hard to make an arc with a simple piece of paper, but you can make a sort of an anti-cusp, which is the same thing. And of course, what you see is that you get a gap. So there's actually tension in in the arc. And so perhaps that you could get a compensatory, uh, a compensation here between the constriction in the cusp and the extension in the arc. If that happened, then of course I'd lose my explanation for, for Namibia. But if, if for that to occur, then the slab would have to shear. 
Okay, and I didn't know whether there's any evidence from seismology for the slab in a cusp actually undergoing a shear deformation. You should be able to see that in earthquakes. So now I'm saying to myself, you know, I'm, and I'm two weeks away from having to submit a paper on this structure. I said, geez, I got to talk to some experts. So as it happens, so I live in Victoria right here. So just up the peninsula is the, uh, is the Pacific Geoscience Center, which has, you know, seismologists and geophysicists mainly, including, you know, a guy named Gary Rogers, who's, you know, famous TV personality for, you know, de you know des describing the, uh, you know, significance of earthquakes here, you know, we're all waiting for the big one here. And so I, I arranged it because I, I used to work up here for a year I, to give a talk up there. And so I went up and, and, and gave, you know, this same talk. And as I'm giving the talk, I, I noticed that Roy Heinemann, a geophysicist, and, and Gary Rogers, this size, they're like bouncing up and down in their seat. And, and Roy is normally a, you know, usually pretty well composed guy. And I'm thinking, geez, what have, what have I said? Notice, incidentally, all the cluster of earthquakes here. And, and so afterwards, they, they just jumped up and 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 of course, what happened is that Gary Rogers, you know, was at the PGC and got a leave of absence to do his thesis at University of British Columbia in Vancouver, which was published in 1983. This was in the, in the in, uh, late 70s. And, um, and this is figure 37 from his thesis. He did exactly the same exper paper experiment that I did. And uh, there was actually a little cluster of papers that discussed this at the time. Um, but they never related this, the Olympic Mountains and the, and the Cascadia cusp to any other feature like the Himalayan, you know, syntaxes or the Oman line. And, and so it was just, you know, it never went beyond the area and it, and it, and it kind of, you know, then it disappeared and, this, and this, this idea was lost temporarily. <laughs> I seem to be good at, at you know, at reviving uh, other people's ideas like, like Kirschfink. And so, of course, now, uh, to be clear, uh, Gary Rogers wasn't suggesting that uh, the slab was torn. He thought it would maybe crumpled up like that. But you see, it explained his earthquakes, because one of the things that he, he was one of the first to recognize uh, this trench parallel compression from the focal mechanisms of the earthquakes. So now, of course, any good theory, any proper theory, you have to test it. And the way to test it is to, is to make a prediction about, you know, the occurrence of, say, in this case, a structure where it's not already known. And so a likely place would be this cusp here, the Erica bend of the uh, uh, Peru-Chile trench. And, you know, I was kind of afraid of this one because I kept looking at it on Google Earth. I didn't see anything here. I said, oh, that's not, that's not good. But then I stumbled on this paper, which I can't hear because I've got a bunch of crap up here, but it's the Manriquez at all from, from uh, 2015, 2015, I think, in, um, in Geophysical Journal. Um, and um, what they, the paper's actually about the flexural properties of the, uh, of the Nazca plate that's subducting here. And uh, in three of the four profiles, they get the normal Half kilometer of, uh, of, of of uplift over the uh, over the fall, fall bulge in the oceanic lithosphere, but in this one here, <laughs> they get between one and a half and two kilometers of uplift. <laughs> so of course, naturally, I'm delighted by that. Now I don't know that this is actually a structure that's related to the cusp. This could be a feature that just you know seamount or something that's being drawn into the subduction zone. I don't know. I can't say, but. Is something that's worth investigating. And then just a few months ago, this paper came out that delighted me even more because this is focal mechanisms of earthquakes. This is the same Erica Bend. And you'll notice they're all going parallel to the trench uh, in the area of the earthquakes that are in the, in the subducting plate. And then the earthquakes in the arc here that are on the overriding plate, of course, <laughs> are oriented down the dip. And so, you know, this shows that you've got this same stress field. And, and it's even more ironic that Stan Dosso is, was actually the chair of, of, of the department I'm in at University of Victoria, and Carlos is one of his students, but because of COVID, I had no idea that they were working on this. So I wanna end with a caution. And that is something that is not quite right in my mind about this. And that is the fact that this constriction of a slab that occurs in a cusp should reduce to zero at the crest of the bulge, right? 
So if it's zero, then, you know, why is there this, you know, amplification at that point of, of the bulge itself? I, is it simply because you've got the intersection of these two four bulges and they have some kind of sort of constructive interference? I'm not very satisfied with that. So what I think is, ne is needed, and this is something I can't do, is that it would be good to look at this with a finite element model to investigate the, uh, the possibility of elastic stress propagation beyond the four bulge crest. In other words, if you consider this, the elastic properties of the, of the lithosphere, does that mean that, that the, the stresses of the constrictive stresses of the stress get propagated into the plate, which you remember is continually subducting into, into this system. Okay, so I, I think that that would be a very interesting and, and value, valuable uh, follow-up. And, uh, and also, I think that uh, uh, it is important to recognize that these are structures are not just an oddball, but a generic class of structures that needs a, a mechanistic explanation. And uh, my well, acknowledgments oh. and oh, sorry. Uh, note the boundary layer inversion here, which shows how cold <laughs> the surface gets at night. Okay. Oh. All right. Oh, thanks so much, Paul. That was that was really cool. I feel really uh, tectonically enlightened. Um, <laughs> uh, so we'll transition to the uh, to the question and discussion session here. Um, we can do that in a variety of ways. Anybody could type their message into the uh, chat box and I can ask it for you. You can go ahead and raise your hand. It looks like Nicholas Chris Tublik is ready to uh, ask. So go ahead and un unmute yourself, Nicholas. Hey, Paul, that was great. That's fantastic. Um, I'm really intrigued by the, the canyon, of course, that you were describing. What can you say about the timing of that canyon? Uh, what we can say is that it postdates the entire thickness uh, of the uh, Otavi group carbonate platform and predates uh, the, the oldest of the local four deep plastics. And the four deep plastics obviously are diachronous, they're younging generally towards the, uh, the subducting plate. But the local plastics, they, you know, they uh, sit on that erosion surface. So in, so in millions of years, where are we? It depends on the uh, rate of plate convergence. Yeah, what would be your estimate? So, uh, typically uh, given the amplitude of a four bulge and, uh, and its width above sea level and a reasonable convergence rate, say of a few centimeters per year, you'd be talking about less than a million years. Right, so in terms of, of, of age, what would you place the age of that feature to be? It's forming over a period of time, but but what would be the age of it? Uh, the the best the only real constraints we have on the uh, are those metamorphic constraints from the the adjacent accretionary prisms, and so that would suggest that the uh, the minimum age of the disconformity would be about six hundred, and so by scaling, uh, you know, carbon isotope records from other ediacaran sections. Uh, very usefully um, compiled recently by Alan Rooney. Uh, I would I would guess make a, an, an estimate uh, of somewhere in the 600 to 615 range um, for that disconformity. Okay, great. Um, All right, Francis. You know, when I get back to Namibia, uh, we're uh, we're going to have another look for uh, ashes at that. Uh, you know, in those four deep classics. That was one of the first things I, I did uh, when I went over to Namibia in the early 90s, was scoured that, uh, that disconformity surface and those overlying classics for tufts, but, and, and without success. Thanks, Paul. But we're going to have Josh, uh, um, uh, I can't remember his name. Anyway, uh, hopefully we, we will get back to it, back on it. All right, go ahead, Francis. Hey, Paul, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, um, I was wondering if you could speak to uh, Ben Goscombe's um, model that has the polarity of subduction in the Kako belt opposite um, to what you show um, from the distribution of metamorphism and magmatism. 
Yeah, well, he's just applying a Cordilleran model because everyone assumes that Cordilleran is well known, which in fact is one of the worst known origins in the world. Anyway, there's, no, there's not a shred of arc magnetism anywhere on the Congo uh, plate. And so therefore I don't, I, I, I see no evidence that, uh, that it was an upper plate um, during, the, during the rifting stage. Okay, it so to be specific, do you- After Swakop terrain was accreted, um, then it became the upper plate. Yeah, so to be specific, you would put the suture um, at the um, purus myelinite zone and keep the calcus origin core on the alochthon, or would you just have the coastal terrain alochthonous? Because the 580 granites go through the origin core also in the cocoa belt. So what's key is like exactly where you put the suture. Yeah, well, I mean, that's right. So they, those could be slab breakoff uh, uh, magmas, in which case they, they can uh, intrude the, uh, the lower plate, just like the Hepburn intrusive suite in Watt Bay. Okay, so I would, so that, that's what I, I wanted I would, to hear. You interpret those as slab breakoff magnetism uh, um, because that origin core is, it looks to be Congo if you look at the detritals for it. It doesn't I, look I, to I be agree, a lot. I, I agree, I would tend to put the, uh, the, the central calcozone zone or origin core as, uh, as, as a locked in as Congo and the okay. suture would be, would, you know, be between that and okay. the coastal terrain. So then for your model, you need those to be slab breakoff magnetism because those 580 granites go through the core. Well, the, the, the one that was dated uh, by, uh, by Seth, uh, you know, that, that's, a, uh, that's a, a, a melt, you know, a, a, a local metamorphic melt granite. You know, because that's, you know, that's in a melt pod in a, in a, uh, in a nice. Yeah, my, district, my, my impression from Goscombe is those are pretty widespread lithologically. But um, yeah, I think, I think it makes a good test for the, for the model and more work yeah, needs to be done hard, on those. There's, there's hardly any geocon. Yeah, no, I, I agree. More work needs to be done on those. Absolutely. All right. I think, Greg, did you have a question next? Yeah, I did. I love that. This is really interesting stuff. Um, but um, I had two thoughts. Like Nick, I was thinking maybe this might be comparable to the Wanaka Canyons, which are dated at, um, what is it, 565 or so, um, and that it might be due to glacioeustatic drawdown. But if you have a date in the 600 to 615 range, that's exactly like the intra noonday dollar stone unconformity in Death Valley, which includes the class of tube stones at the bottom in the Ibex Hills. Um, a very similar situation to Namibia. The similarities between California and Namibia seem to be accumulating the more I look into them. Um, I wonder what your thoughts are about a glacio eustatic contribution to this incision. Well, we have an 800 kilometer long fold belt and the only place in the entire fold belt where you see any significant relief on that contact is right in the cusp. You don't see that anywhere else. But, well, we, do, be, but, they, but we see it in, in Death Valley too, the same. No, but I'm talking about in, uh, in, in Namibia. We have an 800 kilometer oh, right, long right. fold belt and everywhere along the fold belt, except right in the cusp, that one local area, uh, there's no more than you know, one or 200 meters of relief on that contact. Hmm. Fascinating. Now that doesn't rule out uh, a drawdown because, after all, a, a a collisional trench can can easily get cut off. And in fact, the paper that I initially wrote on the uh, uh, on the detachment structure in geology, uh, you know, with at the hearts, we suggested that that may have been a factor. Yeah, I was fascinated. As you see, we needed, we needed, because at that time we were thinking of that slide as being submarine, but then you had to scour that canyon. Right, right. No, you, you really deep one seems almost impossible for glacier used to see, but the 500 meter one, that's about the same scale as the one in Death Valley of about the same age, and also about the same scale as the 565 million year one. Yeah, but uh, this one is associated with kilometers of four deep plastics. The ones you're talking about are not. Uh, that's right. No, so that's it's right at this, you know, it's right at this critical, you know, this is the most important stratigraphic contact in most origins. It's the passive margin to 40. 
because that's where some, you know that's where the margin you initiate the, the active margins phase of the origin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. hasn't even been recognized yet in the Cordilleran, although it's probably the antler event mm -hmm. in the in the in the middle late Devonian. Okay, I think Ian has a question next. Hey, Paul, Ian Dial, are you hitting me okay? Yep. Nice, nice talk. I really enjoyed it. Can I take you to the Andes? Uh, sure. It struck me for a long time that the history of Andean extension and compression from the Triassic through to the present is pretty much the same from the North Scotia Ridge all the way up to at least northern Peru. And yet the Altiplano is only in that one section of the Eureka embayment. I wonder if your ideas ex were, might extend even to, to say why the Antipla Altiplano uplift is there in, in the Arica Bend, because uh, Litherland had the, the actual bend in the going back to the Sunzas Grenvillian age and having, having that embayment there all the way back to a billion years. Any thoughts on that? I think that's a great idea, Ian. I think you should write it up. I, I <laughs> did not. I have not thought of that at all. And what's what's great about it is that we have, you know, we should have must have, a, a, you know, pretty good constraints on when, uh, uh, on on when the high plateau, uh, you know, w was uplifted. And so we could use that potentially. However. Yeah, my I mean, it's pretty, yeah, my, I guess my only concern is that it's pretty far inboard. It's really behind the arc. And so the question mm -hmm. is, would compression that is originating in the slab actually be transferred, uh, you know, uh, is there sufficient uh, mechanical linkage to transfer those stresses uh, into the back arc area? You might not have to have a great deal of stress because the back arc area is going to be, uh, you know, have very high heat flow and, and, and be uh, quite weak. You know, Thorsten Becker, my colleague in, here in Austin, and uh, Claudio Fanchetta suggested that the, the initial uplift going, coming at about 50 million years of the Altiplano itself, which doesn't apply to the Andes, whereas you know the compression starts back at a, in mid Cretaceous time as I said, from North Scotia Ridge all the way up to Northern Peru. But they uh, surmised that at, the, at about 50 million was when the present slab hit the transition zone and related to that. But again, it's, it, there's no reason why it shouldn't apply the length of the Andes and the Altiplano is only in the Eureka Bend. So perhaps worth, so it seems like you think it's worth pursuing it. Yeah, well, and you know, the model, the constriction model uh, predicts a shallow slab. Yes. So that's a, that's a way of getting a, link, a mechanical linkage between yeah. the, uh, yeah. uh, the, the two plates uh, yeah. far inland. And I don't know yeah. whether, I don't know whether the cusp geometry has been advanced as an explanation for the, for the shallow slab. I, I think not. So I think, I think it's a great idea, Ian. I, I encourage you to write it up. I will think about it in COVID times, Paul. Thanks again for a fascinating talk. Yeah, great. All right, it looks like Ava is ready for a question next. Uh, yeah, thanks for your talk. So this, uh, this question is a bit outside of my comfort zone, really, but um, <laughs> Hi, so, uh, <laughs> Hi, um, so there's this whole, this whole field out there about this link between climate and tectonics. And um, I think one of the ideas is that you have very high uplift rates in regions where the climate favors high denudation rates, for example, in the Himalayas. And so when, when, you, when you talked about these extreme canyons, these like, deep incisions, these, these deep canyons there in the near Proterozoic, I was just wondering if you think there could be any linkage there to the, the climate of that time or of that region, especially because it's in this interesting near Proterozoic interval. Okay, so let me answer that in a funny way. Um, both the uh, Nanga Parbat and the Namchi Barwa uplifts are somewhat asymmetric. Okay, they climb up to the west. Okay, and there is a one idea that, that, that has been advanced that those uplifts actually were triggered by incision by those two, by those two big rivers, you know, the uh, Yarlung Tongpo and the uh, and the Indus. Now, if you've ever done any field work in the Himalayas. 
You know that when you go out on Traverse in the morning, you hop across a little trickle. And when you come back in the afternoon, it's a raging torrent. And so I wondered whether the asymmetry might be due to the fact that where those incisions by those rivers are oriented north-south, there's going to be a lot more erosion in the afternoon than there is in the morning, right? Mm -hmm. And that yeah. means the west-facing slope should have, you know, have a lot more erosion, more exhumation, and that should draw mm -hmm. the material upwards and westward, explaining the asymmetry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Thanks. Thanks. Yes, yeah, so I've okay. yeah, actually I've long been a big fan of this uh, <laughs> of um, uh, you know, things like trade winds and whatnot having a lot to do with uh, orogenic structure. We have one more uh, in the chat. So Lyle Harris, he says he's having mic problems, so I'm going to ask his questions. There's a couple, so I'll deliver them one at a time. One. Can you see slab buckling you propose in seismic uh, tomography? Uh, I think that the slab depth, it, it, uh, the earthquakes are, uh, are, are, are a better bet. Uh, slabs are pretty thin, you know, it's pretty, and also they're shallowly dipping. So um, you, you might, yeah, so I, I don't think that, well, I, I'm not an, you know, an, an expert on tomography, but tomography is, is, is uh, is um, yeah. I, to be to be honest, I I'm not aware of much tomographic data from you know a, a sort of that kind of scale in, in, in areas of subduction. Um, you've got earthquakes. You've got uh, um, you know you've got anisotropy. Uh, you have a lot of things. Geophysicists have a lot of things to to play with. Um, okay. The but, second uh, question. but the the, the yeah. earthquake the uh, the folk, the earthquake uh, the, the shallowing of the slab in the Kurils, I mean that that this is this has been known for 30, 40 years or more. And of course okay. the data is ongoing. You know, Ready like, for question number two? So and another question? Yeah, yeah. So it says uh, por porphyry intrusions often occur above slab tears. Example, South America. Do porphyry intrusions also pre preferentially occur in your cusp examples? Well, I haven't worked in the upper plate, so I don't know. And as I say, the big problem in Namibia is we just don't have, uh, you know, the, 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 it's well mapped and the exposure is fantastic, but the, there's almost no geocon. And uh, so, you know, I went over there with an open mind as to what I was going to do, but I ended up working and, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a lower plate kind of guy. <laughs> I think it's best to study origin starting, starting in the autochthon in the lower plate and work structurally upwards. And so I, I have no personal experience. And also a lot of the upper plate uh, in, in, that, in the cusp I'm working on is, you know, is underwater. It's, in, it's on the uh, Atlantic uh, you know, uh, shells. So the person to talk, where's Fabrizio Cazzito? He's the, this is the, 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 the young grand master of the uh, upper plate of, of the- uh, oh, sorry. Casigliano. It is here. Yeah. Yes. So um, I don't think I'm that much, but uh, anyway. <laughs> uh, what was the question again? Porphyries. Um, Porphyry sorry? copper. Porphyry copper, yeah, um, yeah. not really uh, economic rate. We didn't find it uh, yet in the New Proterozoic. Uh, I'm not sure if the New Proterozoic is particularly uh, fertile for that, like for uh, the economic existence. I I'm not really sure. That that's not really being described yet. But um, we have the all of the uh, typical rock types that you would expect for like a Sierra Nevada type batolith and um, Andean type batolith, like the coastal batolith of, of Chile. Uh, it, it just uh, look like petrographically and uh, geochemically the same kind of rocks and even uh, with the isotopic uh, fingerprints as well of subduction zones and uh, mental ice melting, etc. 
So if you put together all of the petrographic and uh, isotopic and geochemical uh, features, uh, it's, it's like uh, pretty safe to assume that you have um, uh, porphyry type systems, but not really economic, uh, import, economically important in that matter. I don't know if uh, that helps in anything, but. Thanks Fabrizio. All right. Well, that, that exhausts all the hands up and the messages. So if anybody would like to go ahead and just unmute themselves just to talk, go ahead. Uh, Paul, uh, great talk. So uh, just uh, a question. Um, as um, the Santicline would be approaching the cusp, it seems like by shearing or by movement parallel to subduction zone, it would be kind of moved to the right or to the left from the cusp itself. And so did you think what determine which way it would go to the right or to the left? And also uh, as it moves to uh, laterally, would it cause extension and rifting in a low plate? Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, it's being compressed uh, symmetrically. Uh, so, but, you know, it might end up flopping one way or the other, like the ones in the Himalayas. They are slightly asymmetric, but most, mainly they've come up. Um, they've, you know, tilted a little bit to one side or the other. Um, whether you would see extension or not um, would depend on where the neutral surface is of the flexor. So above that, you would get extension, but of course, that's what's most susceptible to erosion. So you're not likely to preserve that. Hey, Paul, I got a, I got another question, if, if that's all right. Sure. Um, could you speak against an alternative model that this is just transpressional around a promontory? So basically, all the structural data suggests this is a left lateral transpressional zone. And so why couldn't we expect a perpendicular uplift along a promontory during transpression, creating a lot of the same patterns you're um, actually describing. Yeah, well, I guess, um, so my response to that is that you don't really see evidence for that uh, in the folding of the 4D sediments themselves. Um, you know, so they just seem to be, you know, folded along with the, uh, the carbonates and they just they just look like you know orthogonal compression uh, on either arm of the bend. You don't you know I expected to actually to see uh, because overall the structure looked to me like it was an unstable at that corner was an unstable trip point uh, with a little bit of left lateral motion on both sides and so you had material flow around the corner. That yeah. that's you know what what struck me about the overall overall structure. I can't see much. I don't see a lot of evidence for any, for any, for strike slip though, on the on the on the uh, damra margin, and uh, everything there seems to be orthogonal stretching. Um, you know, based on what we see in the stratigraphy, the paleo flow off the rift shoulders and and uh, and, and things like that. Um, okay. Unfortunately, you know, in the cusp area. You know, over most of that area, you you have exposed basements, so you you know the the record has been lost. So the 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 uh, actual, I'm not sure whether I can go backwards in the slides, but as you know, you have we have better preservation on the on the southeast side of the cusp than we do on the northwest side. Yeah, it'd be nice to get better dates on some of those um, stretching fabrics that are on the coast, because a lot of the transpression could just post-date the proposed cusp you're talking about would be one explanation, and that we didn't really have as much left lateral movement, um, you know, during, um, you know, at circa 600 to 580. You know, Francis, I'm concerned about the whole um, assumption about left lateral shear, because it's very strange to me. I mean, it, it, the way Ben interprets that stuff is that all those stretching fabrics are related to oblique thrusting. But most thrust belts don't thrust obliquely. They thrust, you know, you have partitioning of strain. So in the thrust belt, you get orthogonal thrusting, and then in the and then it's much mechanically much less work to do strike slip 
you know, to, 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 to make the obliquity, the so-called Fitch faults. You know, the Andaman Sea, uh, you know, that, that, that area, classic example of that. And, and, and in the foreland, whenever you have strain indicators, they're always east-west. So I'm, and so there's another way where you could get that stretching fabric, and that is actually by dextral shear. Okay, and, 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 and simple shear. And so I'm a, little, I'm a little bit concerned. And the only photographs I've ever seen of shear sense indicators in the Puros lineament at, at the edge of, you know, are right lateral. If you go and look at the old papers, there are very few photographs of, of um, and I'm sort of kicking myself because I, you know, I drove across that one time years ago and I don't have it in my notes about shear sense. But anyway, the only photographs that are in the literature from that zone that show shear sense, their shear bands are clearly dextral. Now the orientation of the photograph isn't given, so it's not terribly useful, but. Uh, I guess another argument would be down in the Nama and the Reap, although it's a little bit later, um, is there uh, Lyle Nelson and Emmy Smith have been um, sort of documenting that that foreland development is diachronous from um, north to south. So that would be an example of, um, you know, potentially a foreland being developed, um, you know, with a consistent motion. And again, in the Harif, there's a lot of on echelon structures as well. Yeah, well, I addressed that in, in, in my model. So I'm just going to bring it up here if I can. Yeah. So you see the green, that, that's, the, uh, that's the Kalko Harif. And so I'm, I'm bringing that in, in, in a sort of classic way, obliquely and, and, and younging from north to south. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, even in your model in E, you know, you could imagine there with that polar polarity you show that that who have cusp is just a, you know, transpressional structure. Um, well, I don't know. I'm not, the way it's shown is that it's in it's in the contact with the brown plate. Sure. And so, it, it, in fact, it's there's no plate mar margin there. It doesn't. I mean, <clears throat> see, this thing is so confined in time. I mean, that's I think is a striking thing, because the the molden and the and I should clarify that when I say the molden and the otavi, like the four deep and the carbonates are folded together and are parallel, that's on the map scale. If you go to outcrops, of course, they're often discordant because they're rheologically very different, stiff dolomite versus uh, semi-pelite. But on the map scale, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're parallel. And um, so that, that, uh, that unconformity surface occurs. There is some deformation uh, that is associated with it or predates it like that fault. Um, but by and large, um, that the, 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 the creation of the topography is not associated with the deformation. The deformate, the, the main folding is later. And, and, and the disconformity is just passively folding. Paul, I was wondering if I could ask a question, Mr. Lyle. Yeah. I've been um, thinking about sort of the implications for the Kalahari Craton where there should be a very similar cusp um, in your model F potentially. And in, in that year, yeah, you're still on the, you're on the lower plate and you should have the Damara and the Harip and, and be on that, um, on that syntaxis. And that's right where the, the Nauclef naps come in. And I would think that the, the emplacement of, of that thrust sheet, um, it would be hard to localize that on a place that had been significantly uplifted. And I, yeah, I don't know if I'm thinking about it wrong, but I'm just, I've just been mulling that over and I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that. See, I think of the Nalkluft as being a depression because you have to preserve it. I assume the Nalkluft is just a, a small remnant of a much larger thrust. And so the yeah. trick is how do you, is actually preserving it. Um, but that's my point is it's on the cusp and why is that the only place it's preserved? That's the case in a in a zone that should be uplifted. Well, <laughs> we're lucky. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, you know that that that's the you know the the, the story of the clipper. I mean, look at the, the, the pre-Alps. 
you know, the pre-Alps are tiny, you know, compared with the Alps, but they're part of, of Adria. They're part of the African promontory. They're the up, they are the upper plain. And there they are preserved as a little, as a little uh, a tectonic outlier, uh, you know, out in the, <laughs> out in the foreland, in front of, in front of the main range. Uh, and, and it was recognized already by Chart in the, in, in the uh, around the turn of the 20th century. Although the whole nap structure of the Alps was not recognized quite late, actually, not till the 1880s. Okay, any last thoughts for Paul? So let's hope we can uh, get back out there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Well, thanks, Paul, for another really good one. <laughs> okay, thanks, thanks for coming, that. guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thanks for the continued appreciation for the seminar, everybody. Um, yeah, Alex, yeah. thanks, you know, personally, and, and for all of us. It, this has really been a great event. It's just something we, I think we all look forward to every week. And uh, so we're really indebted to you for, you know, for setting this up and, and, and you know, and, and, and working on it, you know, every week. It's been... Uh, yeah. Well, great. Thanks for the, for the recognition there. Yeah, I appreciate it. Okay. Well, everybody, we'll we'll keep going strong throughout the year. So we'll see you this time next week. Yeah. Um. Take care. See you then. Thanks. Bye. See you, Lyle.